Praise God. Amen? Amen. Welcome to the cross again. If you're new here today, we have been centering ourselves here at the cross. Amen? And we're going to continue our series, The Circle of Life, today as we come and, and focus. Has this been encouraging to you to be focused on the cross? Thank you, brother. Amen. I appreciate the feedback you've been giving us as we rearrange the furniture here and appreciate your flexibility and by now, the third, uh, the third Sunday of this, um, some of you are just now getting adjusted. So welcome. Welcome. It's okay. Some of you, we got one more Sunday. You'll be fully adjusted by next week, and then we're going to change it again. So somebody said one thing you can count on around here is change. Amen. We have been looking at the cross at the center of our lives, the cross at the center of our relationships. And, and today we're going to look at the cross and what it means to be the center of our church. And this is more than just symbolism. It is the reality in which we are to live our lives as the body of Christ, that the cross must be in the center of our community, not to the side not, as I've said before, put off in a closet somewhere. The cross must remain as the center of our community. If we're truly going to be the people of God, the Christ followers of God, the cross must always be at the center of our community. Amen? Amen. So if the cross is at the center of the church, I have a question for you. So what exactly is the church? What is this place? What if I came around and asked you to give a definition of the church? How would you do? Are you prepared? Are you ready? Probably if we went around the room because of the church, we could maybe give a stab at a, at a statement, and I will in a moment. But the church is so much more than just one sentence. But there are some commonalities that we can claim, I think, for all of our definitions. But one way of looking at what the church is, is to also look at what the church is not. I want to give you three basic things that the church is not, all right? The church is not a stadium. Church is not a stadium. You know what you do in a stadium? You watch other people perform, right? A stadium is a crowd of spectators who watch the players on the stage perform for them in hopes that the crowd leaves feeling as if their investment of time and finances was worth it, was worth the attendance. The church is not a stadium, a crowd of spectators. Someone observed that the church is much like a football game where there are 24 men on the field in dire need of rest and 50,000 spectators in the bleachers in dire need of exercise. See, the church can be a stadium because everybody is called to the playing field. Everybody. Good catch, by the way. That was awesome. That was quick reflexes there. Um. Everybody is called to be on the field. Amen? We're all players. We've all, we're all disciples. We're all ministers. Do you know that just because I have a title, you know, behind my name, let's make sure it's behind my name of pastor. You may call me Pastor Greg, but pastor goes at the end. I'm first Greg, who is a son in God's kingdom. That's who I am. But I carry a title called pastor. But that doesn't mean that you also aren't pastoring. You may not have a title of a pastor, but we're all ministers in God's family. Amen? We're all ministers. 
the church is also not a mall. We're not a mall. Amen? Anybody like going to the mall besides me? I love going to the mall. Come on, Mike. You don't like going to the mall? I love going to the mall. I love to shop. Sherry doesn't like to shop. Every family has to have a shopper. I was the designated one in our family. I love to shop. I love to shop. But the church is not a mall. A mall is a crowd of consumers shopping for what they want at the lowest price. Right? That's what we go to the mall for. You're going for the lowest price. I found out yesterday that um, my wife, let me tell you how amazing my wife is. Can I brag on her for a moment? Now, some of you guys are going to get really jealous, and some of you ladies are going to be really upset with her. So we're driving, we're, we're uh, actually, before we left the house yesterday, on our way to the Stride uh, for Life. By the way, thank you for all of you that participated in the Stride for Life. Hey, give God praise for that. What an awesome day it was. But as we're, we're, um, we're getting ready to leave for the stride, Sherry says, Hey, honey, you remember that $250 gift card? Uh, it, I think it's a, like a Visa gift card that someone gave us uh, back in, I think it was back the, the first of the year as just a, a, a special gift. I said, yeah. She said, what do you think about going and, and, and getting you a new steel uh, chainsaw? That's my girl. That's my girl right there. I, you know, if I didn't want to break the equipment, I would drop the microphone. I, I had to ask, what did you say? I didn't believe it, Billy. I, did, I was just like, and she said, yeah, why don't we go? You've been wanting a new chainsaw, and so let's go get one today. Lord, you are. God, you do love me. So then we were, uh, we were at lunch with uh, Dean and, and Alyssa, and, and Dean said, hey, well, you know that this weekend is steel days at Ace and Draft. And uh, so I was like, oh, man. I mean, uh, an amazing, you know, permission to buy, and now... A steal of a deal. So I went there, and Steel Days Dean is next week. It's next weekend. But I walked in, and I, and I said, hey, is everything on sale? And the lady looked at me, and she said, what are you talking about? I said, Steel Days. And she said, that's not until next weekend. I was like, oh, man. So I walked out of the store. Why? As excited as, as I was to buy that new Farm Boss Chainsaw 20-inch plate, I walked out because next week I can get a better price. Okay? So, wives, if you love your man, you will send him to Steel Days next week. That'll create some marital issues. Let me give you a couple of characteristics of consumerism in America. All right? Here's how it works. We look for the best product at the cheapest price. Demands the least amount of effort from me. Produces the most benefits at the highest quality. And if the product fails to meet these criteria, then I will find another place to shop or choose a competitor's product. That's how we consume in America. The church is not a mall. The church is not about consumerism. Because if we take our consumerism into our Christianity, this is what we end up with. I want the best church, best building, best programs, best leaders. 
I want it at the cheapest price. Don't ask me for money, or at least only ask for very little. I want, I, I demand, uh, I want the church to demand the least amount of my effort. That means my time, my energy, and my commitment. But I want it to produce the most benefits at the highest quality for me and my family, personal growth, inspiration, knowledge, and personal care. And if, pastor, you fail to produce that, then I will find another church and not sh- or not shop at all and do my spiritual life online at home. Let that soak in a moment. The church is not a mall. The church is not a place where we come to consume at the cheapest price for the least amount of effort, but yet demand the highest quality of product. Um, The saying goes without mentioning, but I'll mention it. You get out what you put in, right? The Bible calls it sowing and reaping. In other words, we reap what we sow. We sow little, we we get little return. We sow great, we get great return. All right? It's the principle, we call it the principle of the harvest. Let me ask you, in a in a consumerism type of ministry, how can you disciple someone with that kind of mindset about church? The simple answer is you can't. You can't disciple. And discipleship means so much more than what we tend to give definition to. Discipleship means a deep commitment and loyalty to growing in our daily walk with Christ. That it is unwavering commitment to Christ, to be a disciple. And and can a person with this mindset ever feel as if they belong within a community of believers if it's all about just taking rather than giving? And the simple answer is no. No, we never will. The church is also not an airplane. Been on an airplane lately? An airplane is a crowd of anonymous people in close proximity heading to a destination point only to go their own ways when they get there. So we fly for a short distance. We're in close proximity. Everything is uncomfortable. You're, you're not sure if you want to talk to the person beside you, get to really know them, and in your mind is, well, this is only a short trip anyway, so I'm just going to be quiet and stay to myself. That's not the church. You might be in here this morning and saying, well, Pastor, right now I am so uncomfortable that it feels like I'm on that airplane because the people to my left and to my right or maybe in front of me or behind me, I don't really know them, and right now you really have me way out of my comfort zone by causing me to look across the aisle at people I haven't met yet. But this is who we are. This is who we've been called to be. Amen? We've been called to live in close proximity to each other when we gather together as His people. And so it is our nature, our value, to get to know each other. Amen? So, who is the church? Here's my stab at a simple definition. A community of Christ followers spurring one another onward to be Christ-like and to spread His message throughout the world. We are a community of Christ followers, and we're going to look at that this morning. We are made for community. We are made to belong, and we are made for relationship. We're made for relationship. You know, our natural tendency is to isolate ourselves, is to corner up and be alone until until the pressure is so great in our life that we cry out for help. And then this is what often happens, I find, at least in today, maybe it's, it's been always been a part of our past, but in today's church culture, we're in the corner, we've told everybody to leave us alone, we're now in crisis, and we shout for help, and then we, 
we just criticize everybody for not already knowing we needed help. And we, we criticize them for not being there for us. When all along, we, we said, I got this. We, that's why we must live in community with each other so that we know one another. Now, it's impossible for you to know every single person in this room at a level that you know everything that's going on in their life. It's totally impossible. Don't even try. You will drive yourself nuts. But you can know a few, and you can relate to all, but we can, and that's what life groups are about. Life group is about going beyond just the surface knowledge that you are so-and-so, you know, put your name there, but also you are so-and-so who is going through this and that who has this hope, this dream, this struggle, you know, these barriers in your life, this sin that keeps knocking at the heart, at at, at the door of your heart. And so I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10, verse 19 to 25. Hebrews 10, verse 19. Now, I want you to think about this. This is important for you to know the background. Hebrews is an amazing letter in the Bible. It's amazing. And it's often confronting those followers of Jesus, those believers who wanted to go back to the traditional way of doing everything. And and the writer of Hebrews keeps telling them, no, man, The old way has been broken. It's been fulfilled in Christ. We don't need to do all those rituals. You don't need to go through all of those things to be near God. Jesus came and He did something new, man. But they kept wanting to go back to the old. Give me the old. Give me the old. And and the writer of Hebrews keeps telling them, no, there is a new thing that God has done in Hebrews 10, 19. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly, everybody say boldly, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. Amen? Before Jesus died on the cross, A priest, only a priest, an assigned priest, I believe it was once a year, could go into the Holy of Holies. And it was so serious, this act of worship, that it is recorded that they would tie a rope around his ankle as he went into the Holy of Holies behind the curtain that separated the people from the Holy of Holies, and into the Shekinah glory. And they had this this rope around his ankle. In case he messed up and died, they would just pull him out. Ain't nobody going in there to get him. They would just drag him out. And, And that's how serious the holy place was. It was a place of holiness. And you may have boldly stepped in as a priest, but you went very carefully, very carefully. And what the writer of Hebrews tells us, dear brothers and sisters, we can now boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Boldly enter. Now it's important that we understand this for the context that we're going to about how the cross impacts our community, how we live in community. This is so important. In verse 20, by his death, Jesus opened a new, everybody say new, and life-giving, say life-giving, a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. So now, by his death, there is a new and a life-giving way that has been opened up to all who come to Him. 
Amen? For every follower of Jesus in here this morning, there is nothing that separates you from God. You can go boldly because of what Jesus has done through the cross. Through His death, through the shedding of His blood, you can now come boldly, and the curtain that was there, it has been torn. There is no separation anymore. We can come boldly and have fellowship with God. Aren't you excited about that? Amen. It's not slick preaching that gets you into the holy place. It's not perfected music and worship on the stage that gets you into the holy place. It's not, you know, some grandiose ritual that we can do here on a Sunday morning that takes us into the holy place. The Bible says it is through the cross. If Jesus is the door, my friend, the cross is the key. And we cannot enter into the presence of God unless we hold the key. And God has given it to us. He has said, look, help yourself come any time you want because what I have provided for you. Not what you can provide for yourself, not what your neighbor can provide for you, but because of what I have done for you through my body and my blood on the cross. Amen? This is so important. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 21, And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting Him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled, oh, sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. And our bodies have been washed with pure water. Again, friend, this wall of separation, this curtain of separation has been torn through what Jesus has done. And now we can have fellowship with God. We can be in His presence. Do you know how awesome that is? That you can literally be in the presence of Almighty God. And we don't have to tie a rope to your ankle. That's awesome. Here's my concern for a lot of Christ followers today is that we don't understand the importance of being in His presence. That we stay in the outer courts of where He is. Because in the outer courts, we'd rather just kind of play around with religion rather than go into His presence and truly experience Him in a way that will transform our lives. You see, when we come into the presence of God, we will never leave the same. There's no possible way. You can't get near His blood and not be transformed. We sing it all the time. There is power, power, wonder-working power. Wonder-working power in the blood, in the precious blood of Jesus. You can't get near His blood and not be changed. And there's a lot of people that want to stay afar from the cross because they know if I get near that, I know that he's going to be speaking into some things in my life that I do not want to give up. I am not ready to change. And so we walk around the cross as we talked about last week. We just do circles around the cross and, and, and you know, we do religious things. We may even come this morning and take communion like we have a hundred times before, but we just want to say, Pastor, don't get me near the cross. I'll take communion out here. The reason I had this communion set around this cross is so that we could come to the cross and experience communion today. We'll get to that in a moment. I told Pastor Brad it serves another purpose because people are concerned that we're going to step right off of this stage. And so it serves as a little bit of a barrier as well. So verse 23, so 
let us hold tightly. Oh, I love that. So let us hold tightly. Grip it with your whole might without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Now listen. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Now, there's an interesting connection here. So the writer of Hebrews is saying, through the cross, God has rendered the separation wall between us and God. And now watch what he does. He says, not only has it torn the wall down between us and God, it's torn the wall down, Larry, between you and me. It's rendered the wall between you and me. There's no separation. There should be no separation now between us. If we also claim His blood for our lives, there's no separation between me and you, Linda. It's been rendered. And he says, therefore, don't neglect coming together as His people because of what Jesus has done. Is this making any sense? Is this getting anybody excited more than me? I get so excited about this. This is liberating. You see, now we move beyond coming to church, assembling. That's what it means, to assemble yourselves together as the ecclesia, the body of Christ. It's, it's more than just coming to church as a ritual. We come to actually be together. That is our motivation. We're here to be with God and be with each other. Isn't that awesome? We're not here to pick and choose from a religious buffet. Well, I think I'll take a little bit of that today, and I'll think, you know, well, I'm feeling like some of that today. And, you know, Pastor, where is the dessert table? And so we're not consumers. In that way, we're not here just, well, I'm here this morning and I'm just going to stand back and just kind of watch and see what happens. If you are a follower of Christ, do you understand that what Jesus did on the cross was not just to set you free to be in God's presence, He set us free to be in each other's presence. He created us to be in community. He created us to live with Him and with each other. This is awesome. This is liberating. Because once you understand that coming to be together is not just about fulfilling a church attendance requirement that someone, you feel like someone, your spouse or maybe your parents or someone has put upon you, but it is about I get to go and be with the people of God today. I get to go. I don't have to go. I get to go. When you leave for your life group this week and you're on your way to so-and-so's house, you get to go and be with the people of God because of what Jesus has done. Not because of what your leader has done for you, not because of what a member in the group has done for you, not because of what the pastor has done for you, but because of what Jesus has done for you on the cross. Friend, that changes everything. That's a game changer. Is that we gather for Him and for each other. Oh, praise God. Can you just give Him thanks? Just give Him a clap of praise. So now I want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. Verse 5. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you, God 
is light. Say that with me. God is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. So, we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God and go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. Mary Beth Bowman made an observation last week. When I was preaching and, you know, as I was moving away from the cross, I was talking to you about, you know, the the nearer we get to the cross, the more we are in the light when we're near God. But then the deeds of darkness are over here. And she said, you know, Pastor, the further you got away from the cross, the more dark, the the more darkness you, you landed in, you walked into. And that is so true. The further we are from the cross and what Jesus has done for us, the more darkness we will find ourselves walking in. That's why I like that old hymn. I listened to it this morning. And when I listen to it, it it always has to be Alan Jackson singing it. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. And in that song it says, and I cling to the old rugged cross. I grip it. I let it not out of my embrace. I cling to the old rugged cross. Friend, that's that's what we're talking about. Your relationship with God and your relationship with one another will be best when you cling to the cross, when you meet at the cross. That is where God's light will shine upon you. So it says in verse 6, so we're lying if we say we have fellowship with God and go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. In other words, if I'm living my life over here in darkness and I say, oh, yeah, man, you come up to me. How's, how's everything going, man? How's your relationship with God? It's never been better, dude. It's never been better. It's awesome. Really? Well, what are you doing over here in this darkness? Look, don't judge me, man. That's, that's when we pull out the judgment. Don't judge me. Pull out the don't judge me card. Don't judge me. Verse 7. We, we, but if we are living in the light as God is in the light, listen to this, then we have fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Are you seeing this? Do you want to have fellowship? Let's just, let's just say in your marriage. You want to have fellowship in your marriage? You want to have close, intimate relationship in your marriage? Then husband and wife, you better cling to the cross. You have to walk in God's life. Not in your light, in God's light. You want to have fellowship in your home with your kids? Then bring your kids around the cross and you cling to the cross. And the Bible says it's when we live there in God's light that we have fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. In other words, He continues, He not only nailed our sin nature to the cross, but He also nails our sins continually as we come to the cross. Does that make sense? Just because your sin nature has been nailed to this cross doesn't mean you're without sin. Listen to what the writer says. If we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we're calling God a liar and showing that His Word has no place in our hearts. I don't think anybody in here this morning wants to call God a liar. I certainly don't. So when we're living near the cross, we can be open and honest with what's going on in our life. 
when we're living over here in the darkness, man, we lie, we cover up, we try to put, we put on a facade. We tell everybody, you know, walk into church, how you doing? Oh, I am blessed and highly favored of God. Yeah, but you know, I, I, I noticed that you and your husband were arguing out in the parking lot. Oh, that's just the devil. I'm blessed. Yeah, but I, I heard that you went to the doctor this week and, and, and you got some really bad news. Oh, no, not a problem in me. Man, when we live in the light, we can look at our Christian brothers and sisters who we're in fellowship with, and we can say, I have sinned. Not because of what they are going or going to do or not going to do for us, but because of what He has done for us. And so we can come into the circle of fellowship and walk in the light. Isn't that what you're inviting everybody to do at Celebrate Recovery every Sunday afternoon, Brandon? Come into the light, man. Come into the light. We all know that you're struggling. We all know that substance abuse or hurts or hang-ups or, or, or you know, tripping you up in life. Come on, man, let's just be honest. Let's get around the cross. Maybe you ought to bring every single one of them in here tonight and just get around this cross and say, okay, come, kneel at this cross, and let's really get honest. Because remember, Brandon and I have had this conversation, and I love his heart. We both believe this. When you get honest under the blood, you leave changed. You leave changed. God wants to deliver you and heal you. Galatians 5, we're going to end here. Galatians 5. Or as one of my favorite preachers, Tony Evans, says, Galatians! <laughs> Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. Those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them there. Have you done that this morning? Have you done that? Have you really done that? Have you nailed the passions and the desires of your sinful nature to the cross and crucified them there? And maybe you're saying, well, Pastor, sure I did. Five years ago, I did that. Every single day requires a death. Every single day. If sin has creeped into your life again within those five years, it's time to nail them again. It's time to nail those desires and passions to the cross because then verse six, uh, uh, chapter 6, verse 1 of Galatians. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. If you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You are not that important. Now, that's right out of the Bible, okay? <laughs> that's not Pastor Gregism. Do you see the connection? I could take you for I could take you literally for hours through the scriptures and show you the connection between what God has done for us and how it impacts how we relate to each other. We have not been called to just cling to the cross for ourselves. We've been called to cling to this cross so that we can walk with each other. And that walk is done best when everybody is walking in the light. Amen. Everybody's walking in the light. You know, many of the life groups you just started meeting this week. Could I have a life group volunteer? Uh, you know, if, if your life group would like to volunteer for another 
illustration. Come on up. Okay, Debbie, thank you for volunteering your life group. All of Debbie's life group members, come up here on the stage. <clears throat> Yay. All right. Now we know who you are. All right, I want you to do something real simple. I want you to make a circle, hold hands together around this cross. Oh, welcome. Look, you just... Y'all are adding members. Anybody else would like to join this life group? They're taking members right now. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, ladies, this is a real picture of life group. And those of you who are in life group right now, I want you to take a mental snapshot or get your camera out and take a picture so that you won't forget. This is a picture of life group. We are connected one to another with Christ in the center. So, if at life group this week or this morning, Sherry, would you like to confess a sin real quick? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just teasing. If <laughs> Save it for life. Look, if she begins to share her sin in this group, she's speaking out this way, right? Her voice has to go through the cross. So often, we think that Christian community is about sharing our lives together without the cross and doing our best to help each other manage the sin that's in each other's life. So the, the, it, without the cross here, and if I could lift that up and remove it, I would, but I'm not about to. But picture this group without the cross in the center. Here's what happens. Sherry shares a, a struggle that she's having, a sin. Let's say that it's a sin that she committed this past week. Without the cross in the center, maybe Debbie says, well, Sherry, I'll tell you what you need to do. Here are three things that you need to do to fix that problem. Or, or maybe, maybe you know, an, another member just looks at her and says, maybe Tammy says, you know what, Sherry, you just need to stop doing that. Stop it. We begin to give advice. We begin to give counsel. Or let's say that, you know, someone else just begins to share about their experience of the same sin. Well, you know, when I was committing that same sin, this is what was going on in my life and how I fixed it. Why don't you try that? Look, all those things may be relevant at some point. But my friend, when someone becomes vulnerable in the light of the cross and near the blood of Jesus, we bring them to Jesus, not to ourselves. And so we, we gather around her and begin to pray and begin to let her pray and, and, and let that confession fall on the cross, not on us as her deliverer. Does that make sense? If, a, if the cross is missing in this group, here's another thing that can typically happen. The conversation changes. Without the cross, the conversation changes. Let's say that, you know, this is the ESPN group. All these ladies love sports. And so they come together, and rather than talking about their lives and, and what God is doing in them, not just their sin, but their hopes and their dreams and the miracles as well, they begin to talk about what's important. Well, you know, you will, won't believe how the Redskins stomped the Cowboys last weekend. I mean, that would be important to talk about. This is totally unplanned, but it works. And you will cook, and you will you will gather a crowd of those people with that kind of conversation. But as soon as 
But as soon as the pastor comes in and says, ladies, this is not the ESPN life group. You need to talk about the sin that's in your life. You need to talk about what's real in your life. Now the motivation changes. Yeah. Just changed, didn't it? Yeah, now he's got to decide whether he wants to stay in this group or not. You move the conversation off of Christ, off of the center of Christ. The, 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 the dynamics of the group totally change. Do you see that? Politics, say it's the, it's the political group. And now we're going to have Trump roast. Huh. Easy, conservatives. Easy. You know, and now we're just going to talk about all the politics. It, it changes. It changes the, the dynamic. My friend, the life group, living in community together, the wall of separation has been broken for us to enter boldly into God's presence with each other. Is this making any sense to you? Oh, I hope it is because it will transform your life. Friend, when we talk about life groups here in our church, we're not just talking about join an organization. We're talking about joining a community of people who will walk with and love each other unconditionally. Not because they have the will and the power to do it, but because of what Jesus has done for all of us. Amen? That's where we live best. We live best in this way. Our church body, as we gather here on Sunday morning, do you now see this is just a microcosm of, of what's going on here right now? You're looking across the room. You've been doing it all morning, looking at people on the other side, and you've been thinking, wow, I, I'm, I might need to uh, know that person. You know, I might have a conversation with them. You know, I haven't seen them in a while. In, in other words, we need to see each other. We need to see each other, not just come and, and fulfill a religious duty. We need to see each other. Right now, the Barna Group says that the average Christian attends church twice a month. And the statistic shows that there is a decline in participation. Now, I don't know if that holds true for Cornerstone Church of Augusta, but across the board, across the nation, the average Christian attends church twice a month. A survey done among, among Christians said that they will attend more often if there's, if there's nothing else better to do. We're becoming, as a nation, the very thing that Hebrews was warning the Jews, the Christian Jews, who were caught up in ritualistic ceremonies, we're becoming that very thing. And I'm calling, and other pastors across this nation are calling, the church back to the centrality of the cross. It's not the centrality of the worship team. It's not the centrality of the preacher. It's not the centrality of the type of music that we sing. It's not the uh, centrality of the type of Bible version we read from. It's the centrality of the cross. It's the blood of Jesus that will set us free. It's the blood of Jesus that torn that wall of separation. Amen? Worship team, thank you. Give them a hand for being such a wonderful life group and accepting this, this sinner into their midst. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was already asking about what kind of snacks they had. Leave it to a man, right? So, Brian, will you come and just open up the communion table, please? Um, so this morning we come and we have communion together. What does communion mean? It means everything that I've been preaching this morning. This represents the body of our Lord that died for us on a cross to set us free. 
And we are not to approach this table lightly. Paul warned the Corinthians. He said, look, you, you come very carefully. He said to the Corinthian church, you examine your heart before you come. You make sure you really want to be here. You make sure when you come boldly, you also come thoughtfully. And so this morning, my friend, if there is anything, any sin that is separating you and God, if there is sin that's separating you and your spouse, your children, your parents, your life group members, your other church members, your ministry uh, partners, if there's anything that is separating you from anyone and God, come into the light. There is no condemnation here. There is no judgment here. There is grace. I want you to just picture a waterfall of grace just flowing out of this cross to the people who come near it. There is, there is absolutely no sin that you could confess this morning that would shock me. You might shock some other people in this room, but you won't shock me. God is not shocked. God doesn't say, oh, wow, I can't, I never knew that was going on in your life. Wow, where was I at? He's already there. He's already looking at your heart. He's trying to get your attention to look at your heart. Because if you don't look at your heart, then you will only fool yourself. As, as, as 1 John teaches us, you will only fool yourself by saying, hey, there's nothing wrong with me. I got it all together. And the Bible says, you call God a liar. So I'm calling us to a deeper level of transparency and honesty. And believing that there is an atmosphere in this room created by the hearts and the commitments of the people who are the Christ followers in this room, that there will be no judgment, there will be no shame, there will be no rejection, but there will be love, acceptance, and forgiveness. I don't care if you are a leader of a ministry, if something is not right in your life, today is the day to clean yourself to the cross. You don't have to put on an appearance for anybody, nobody, the pastor isn't going to be standing back here taking notes. Well, it's all on video. I can just look at it later. And just wondering, you know, well, yeah, <laughs> well, we'll need to follow up with that person. You come to the cross, my friend, you're doing business with God. And I believe that there is going to be love and grace that you're going to experience. And then, share in His supper. He invites you to the table where His body was poured out for you that you may experience His love, acceptance, and forgiveness every single day. Every day. Let's pray.